Aloha, my name is Winston Welch, and this is the newest edition of Out and About on the ThinkTech live streaming network series, where we explore a variety of people, organizations, and the topics of interest in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any of my comments are not related to any organization that I may be affiliated with. That said, I am delighted today to have a very special guest come back to the show. It is Mr. Miles Ritchie, Programs Director of the Outdoor Circle, a wonderful organization uh, that's been around for over 107 years. So thank you so much for being uh, with us today, Miles, as we talk about planting for the future, exceptional trees and beyond. Okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, you have been with the Outdoor Circle for a few years now. Can you tell us about what is the Outdoor Circle? What's its uh, history? What's its mission? What are its goals? Right. So uh, for those who haven't heard of us, we are a statewide uh, environmental nonprofit that began in 1912. So we've been around for quite a long time. But the kind of claim to fame um, began with the banning of billboards. And the whole interesting story, if you want to check that out on our website, um, really fascinating story of how that came about. But then it also focused on um, maintaining view planes and also tree conservation around in um, urban areas, but also elsewhere, just keeping the trees that we have and trying to plant many more new ones. So you uh, have branches all over the states, all over the state of Hawaii, right? It is only a Hawaii-based organization. And, uh, That's correct, yep. Ten, uh, ten branches. And branches. Okay. And so um, you are the programs director there. So what has been your tra trajectory with this organization? When did you start and how has your um, career developed there? Right. So I've been with the Outer Circle for going on six years now. And over that time, um, we've you know done a lot of really great, innovative things. So the organization was known in the past, as I mentioned, for um, tree-related efforts. So there's been um, figures that we found in some of our documents that the organization has planted statewide roughly one million trees, which is pretty incredible over our entire, um, you know, over our, our century uh, existence. But what we've also been known for in the past was just, you know, getting into schools and doing environmental education for students, um, benefits trees, and we're definitely kind of ramping that up again. Uh, as we discuss the potential impacts of climate change, how trees and other factors can be used as uh, mitigation impacts. And uh, yeah, so the programs we're working on are definitely some pretty cool and innovative stuff for the last few years and, and going ahead as well. Now, did you start as a programs director there or um, how did you get into the organization? How did you hear about it and what were your right. initial thoughts? Um, no, so I learned about the organization from a... Uh, family friends. He's uh, been involved with it for years. So uh, when finished up at UH, decided, hey, you know, maybe see what this field's like. Um, got an internship, started the process and have been here ever since. So it's been a pretty fun experience. And uh, did you env envision yourself working for an environmental organization when you were uh, a high school student or something? Is that something that you thought of? No, I don't, I don't think that far back. It was more so, you know, once you hit the university, take a few courses, uh, kind of determine what you are passionate about and anything involving that, mine became trees. Uh, it was kind of near the end that things began to look like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe do the environmental conservation sector, do some really good work and uh, kind of help the state here. And that's and there it is. And so you have become the programs director. So you've got more than one program that you've that you've carried out and that you're currently carrying out. So what kind of programs do you have uh, or have you carried out recently and that you've got planning uh, coming up in the future? Right. So um, in the past, we've done everything from um, just, you know, the tree planting events to partnering with Google for their program, which is, you know, fascinating going around. And if any Anybody's ever done or used Street View? Um, essentially, it's going with a big backpack out to locations that we receive permissions to go to and highlighting some of the important cultural, environmental, and historical aspects of those areas. Um, so that was very cool. And there's some cool uh, scientific research that's being done with that, with doing comparisons over time. So we have the baseline imagery, and you can use that when you go back and look at maybe invasive, uh, invasive species 
encroachment over time or or other things in of that nature so that one was definitely interesting but we've been doing a lot of collaborations with other nonprofits entities for the past few years since i've been here and that's resulted in um you know assisting with smart tree specific and other nonprofits citizen forester program or working with UH and their, one of the professors in the geography department, Dr. Camila Mora, who has been getting a lot of publicity lately for the carbon neutrality challenge that we were one of the first nonprofits to really get on board and support his efforts and get uh, thousands of trees on the ground. So it's been a shift from, or rev revitalization, I guess, of you know, plantings and uh, environmental education to not just only students, but the general public, which is just as important, um, but also forming those really good relationships with others so you can collectively use your resources to get important things done that you might not otherwise be able to do so. Don't tell us, you mentioned citizen forester. What is a citizen forester? Right. So essentially, a citizen forester is um, a member of the public who is passionate about trees, maybe has a lot or no prior knowledge uh, about urban forest, tree identification, uh, how to measure them, anything like that. So the program itself just allows interested people who may care about trees the opportunity to come to um, some trainings, become certified, and that usually you know is over the course of two weeks, uh, maybe four to six uh, classroom sessions and then outdoor sessions as well. They become certified and then they go around town uh, all around Oahu and they start gathering height, diameter, health, crown spread, and the GPS coordinates of the city's public trees. So in uh, street trees, trees in parks, things like that. And then the data is used to create an inventory so we know not just how many trees are on Oahu and then hopefully the rest of the state, but also um, how healthy they are and the different ecosystem services they provide to us. So carbon sequestration, stormwater runoff avoidance, pollutants removal, energy savings, even property value increases. So it's a really useful data set that the citizen foresters are using, and they're able to take these skills and use them elsewhere later in life as well. And uh, is that because the city right now doesn't have a good inventory of its trees or it doesn't really know the condition of them? Or uh, why is this even necessary? The county has a lot of area to cover with all these trees. So um, you, it's always great to have a updated inventory yeah. so that can be extremely costly and a lot of people don't realize that to, to hire a company to go out and do that is a lot of money so you have the ability to reach out to members of the public not only get the inventory with um pretty reliable data we we do go out and verify and ground truth the data itself to to make sure that we're getting good quality information but we're also educating the public at the same time, which is arguably more important so that they can take what they've learned, they can pass it on to friends and family and kind of um, branch out these really important concepts that we need in this um, kind of era of climate change and necessary mitigation. And people can find out about a program like that or your other programs at OutdoorCircle.org, right? That's and, correct, yes. And find, see a whole bunch of different ones. You mentioned another one I thought it's, it's interesting that maybe people haven't heard about. Carbon neutrality. Can you tell us what does carbon neutrality mean? We, I, I get to the two words, but what are they together? Right. So uh, as I mentioned, that's the program uh, created by Dr. Camila Mora at the University of Hawaii. It's essentially planting trees to offset your carbon emissions for the year. So if you, you go onto the website that Dr. Mora has created, you input your daily lifestyle. It'll give you your carbon footprint emissions for the year, which is not new. Lots of websites do that. However, his website will show you exactly how many trees you need to plant of a certain species to become carbon neutral. Oh. And then the program allows you to say, well, okay, that's great. I need to plant 20 monkey pods this year to become carbon neutral. What, what can I do then? And then the third part is you just go out and then we give you the opportunity to plant trees. So it's this whole process of education, learning how to make a difference and then actually doing it to become so, carbon neutral and, and yeah, sequester all that carbon. But so it's very cool. So you can go on and actually, instead of having some sort of vague idea of how much carbon you emit or buying a carbon credit when you take a plane to the mainland, you can actually roughly estimate how much carbon you are producing each year and then what, how many, uh, I guess, endemic types of trees or even non-endemic types of trees you need to plant every year 
to remain carbon neutral? Correct. So we're focusing on native trees. Um, just there's a whole slew of benefits uh, in, in addition to carbon sequestration that na planting natives and reforesting the natives has, bringing a lot of bi biodiversity back that is dependent on those specific trees and uh, a whole bunch of other aspects. But yes, we're focusing on native plants and the programs has grown exponentially in the past several years from, you know, uh, 50 trees, then 100, then 1,000. And then Dr. Moore was just out in December um, putting 10,000 trees on the ground. I know he's looking at 100,000 coming up. So it's a it's a ambitious and extremely worthwhile project that the public is getting behind. Which is and and I know you've been intimately involved with uh, all of those details. And so I, we've got a couple of slides here showing um, some other tree planting related efforts here. Um, if we can go to that one. And what are we looking at here? Right, so this is the um, Hilo Outdoor Circle um, tree giveaway event that occurred back in June. It was, uh, as I mentioned, a collaborative event between the Arbor Day Foundation, FedEx, the Outdoor Circle. And uh, we had a whole bunch of local uh, nurseries propagate plants, natives and fruit trees that we were able to give away thanks to this um, wonderful donation, this grant from the Arbor Day Foundation and FedEx. So the Hilo and more so East Hawaii community came out and were able to, they just lined up and they were, received some free trees that they were going to go plant on their own property because that's one of the aspects that a lot of people don't think about. Yes, you can plant in parks or you could plant in parks or more street trees, but yeah. one of the largest areas that isn't utilized are people's own private properties. So if they're interested, but maybe they would not plant because they don't know what plant to choose or they just don't want to go spend the money on it. This hopefully gives them the opportunity to choose a plant based on expert opinions because we have master gardeners, we have arborists at these events. Um, so, you know, I live in Volcano and here's the plant palette that will work for you. You're getting a tree that's for the right place and then you're also getting it for free. So then we're hoping that we can get more urban tree canopy cover through these events, these tree giveaway events. Okay, and then it's a terrific uh, thing that was on the Big Island after the they had some disasters over there, uh, the volcano, the the floods, and also had some, one other thing. Um, it was a whole, it was a it was a pretty rough summer. A bad year. Sure, so. Okay, so so we've got right. to give and back to the a, community. Yeah. Just a just a quick plug, real fast. Um, we are doing another one of these events in Hilo this year. We're going to be uh, take, conducting one in October. The date is most likely going to be the second or third week, so details will be coming out on our website, you know, uh, outdoorcircle.org, or our Facebook page and emailing list. But also our Man uh, Manila branch is having a tree giveaway, their um, annual thousand tree giveaway, which is going to be in Manoa on the 24th of April. All this information, as I said, can be found on our website, social media pages, and things like that if people are interested. Facebook, uh, Outdoor Circle. Uh, just Google that, OutdoorCircle.org. And then for the Manoa tree giveaway, that's a super popular one. What time, you've helped with that before. How how many trees do they give away and what time do you need to be there to get a tree? So the minimum is uh, 1,000 trees. Generally, there are more. It's a great collective event where um, members of the Outdoor Circle and Malama, uh, Malama Manoa actually propagate these plants on their own for upwards of two years. And then they bring them all together. So there's at least a thousand trees generally, but they're, um, I've seen in years past upwards of 1500. So there's a whole range from fruit trees to natives to, to, to monkey pods, everything like that. So it's a great event. Uh, I highly recommend getting there early. I know it usually, I'm not sure on the times itself, it might be an eight o'clock or nine o'clock start, but people start lining up around six or seven in the morning. So they okay. it's a first come first serve basis. Okay, and we got a couple more pictures and then we'll go to a break, but uh, right here, what are we looking at this photo? Sure, so this is another collaborative project with the Arbor Day Foundation. This was with Enterprise Car Rental and us at the Outer Circle. Um, this saw uh, Windward Community College receive a bunch of free trees. We worked with them. They, they're working on a new master plan to include a lot more trees in their campus, especially right there where that image was shown on the Great Lawn. We um, went in and put 30 large native trees and it was just a great um, community event. It was uh, there, those volunteers you were seeing were either Windward Community College students or staff or enterprise um, employees. So it was a really good dynamic 
different group of people. We taught them how to plant trees right, the importance of the natives we're selecting, the cultural and historical background of them all. So it was a really good event. And if anybody goes to the Great Lawn now, they'll see these 30 new large trees, which is great. That's awesome. And I know that they had, the, for people who hadn't been to Windward in a while, they had a, an incredible canopy of trees, which really were decimated by the uh, gall wasp uh, hitting the banyan trees there. So this is part to kind of replace some of those. So it looks like you got a lot of terrific programs, a lot of collaboration. I know that's a lot of work getting your own group together, but getting working with other groups is a huge amount of effort. But uh, obviously you're, you're super successful at it and got these things coming up. So again, if people want to follow along, they can go to outdoorcircle.org and we're going to take a little break. We've been talking with Miles Ritchie, the programs director at the Outdoor Circle, where he is doing fabulous things along with all of his colleagues and volunteers and uh, related uh, organizations. So we will be back for more of the story in a minute. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Being a lawyer has many aspects, and I try to cover them every time I do a program of Law Across the Sea. Not everything has to do with law or being a lawyer per se. Some of it has to do with the people you meet, the things you see, the places you visit. And that's what I try to combine in Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Thank you for watching. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back. My name is Winston Welch and you are tuned into Out and About, a show every other week on Think Tech Hawaii, where we explore a variety of topics, people, events, and organizations that do good in our community. we got a fabulous uh, organization and terrific young man representing the Outdoor Circle. Mr. Miles Ritchie, the programs director, and we have been talking about programs that he does as well as what the organization does. And Miles, welcome back to the show. Um, can you tell me uh, one of the things Outdoor Circle is known for is trees uh, and and the exceptional tree program. People may not know what an exceptional tree. Well, you get the words, but what does it mean? What's the exceptional tree program? What do you have to do with it? What's going on with that program and how have you furthered it? Right. So uh, essentially, the Outdoor Circle is the organization and it's the whole um, helped pass some legislation back in 1975. It was Act 105 that established protections um, for trees of importance around the state. So they just uh, they determine them exceptional trees and they are um, worthy based on the criteria of age, rarity, location, size, aesthetic, quality or endemic status. So if a tree meets one or more of those, it has the potential to be put on this exceptional registry, which does have some benefits. So like I said, uh, it provides legal protections for unnecessary removal unless the committee, so how it kind of works is it's a statewide law, but each county has an arborist advisory committee that receives nominations, they meet frequently, and then they will go and look at potential candidates. And then if they determine they meet the criteria, they will put them on the, the county's registry. Okay. At that point, unless the Arborist Advisory Committee delists a tree for some unusual reason, which is very infrequently, unless the tree poses a public safety risk or dies, it's going to be on that list. So it's a great opportunity to, I guess, protect some of the most valuable tree specimens that we have for future generations from development and other aspects where these trees are a valued part of our society that we should protect. And that's what it allows. What were those, well, tell me again, run through the categories of protection again that, that we have in Hawaii. Sure, so um, so you want the criteria? Yep, like the, or, you said age? Right, yeah, so we're looking at essentially um, age, rarity, location, size, aesthetics, um, endemic status. So those are the ones that will meet the, the list. As I said, one can make it, uh, if a tree meets one of those, it's fine. But if it has more, 
of those characteristics, then it has a greater chance of being put on the list. Um, there's also a tax credit that comes with each one of these trees. So uh, if you're a private property owner, there's an incentive to, it's a $3,000 tax credit every three years, and that's towards maintenance for your tree. So you prove that you had an arborist or whoever come and trim your tree or take care of your tree, then you submit this during your uh, during tax season, and then you actually get the tax credit. So it's a nice incentive for people on private property or homeowners to go and take care of these trees that may otherwise incur some costs that they would want to remove them if they weren't an the exceptional list. Okay, and if people want to nominate a tree or get on this list and get the tax credit, I remember it's on it's on the tax forms. I see it there. Do you have an exceptional tree? Uh, how would how do they do that? So they would just go to our website. Uh, is um, as I mentioned before, outdoorcircle.org, and you'll Can't see it enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's a exceptional tree location on the website, and it's got all the details um, for each county. It's got each nomination form, which is great. Or if you want, you can always check out each county's individual arborist advisory committee. But ours has everything in one spot, so it's just very convenient if you want to check it out. And how have you furthered this program, or what work have you done with it um, to advance the exceptional trees of Hawaii? Right. So since I started, like I said, about six years ago, um, the program was kind of in, it was not well known. And to this day, it's still not as well known as it should be. So we've been doing a lot of activism work, um, presentations, going in, working with different age people from, you know, um, community groups, schools, uh, to tell them about these trees. And we've also decided to make it easier because we as ourselves were looking through the registry and you know where are these trees what are their benefits how why were they selected so that's what we've been working on right now is this exceptional tree map so we went we through got all, a slide of that map. i think yeah yeah that'd be great it's uh if we start with six that'd be awesome um essentially what happened is we didn't know where these trees were they were on the registry but from each county some of them would say you know off mile marker 11 on you know one of maui's major highways it's kiave which is pretty big. Um, others would be, you know, the Eva Mackay side of this property in Manoa. So it makes it a lot easier. So it was very, there's a lack of standardization. So we wanted to make it easy for people to know where these trees are, if they're public or private, and then their various metrics. So you can see here, there's eight, there's diameter, there's health. It's a lot of the, the basic trees you see. But then we also use that to calculate the ecosystem services for each tree. And they're pretty substantial because a lot of these are large. Um, while they don't have to be large to be an exceptional right. tree, that is generally one of the most common traits we've seen. So we've made this a really easy resource for a lot of people to just go on and check, find out where they are. There's a library on there that tells you fun facts about each tree species on the list and uh, just a lot of really good resources. And a photo of every tree on there too, as well, uh, that you've and gone And a link out to their street view, yes. And the street well. view good. you've taken individually of uh, over a thousand trees. There's, okay, there's one of that's, what are we looking at here? Uh, so you have the, the K-Pok tree over at uh, Youngin, um, kind of Eritania, Kamuku, yeah. um, right in on Oahu. And this one's an ear pod in Manoa. This is actually the one I was just referring to uh, in the example, but you can see these, these are really iconic and important looking trees. You have the, the Indian Banyan over in Lahaina in Maui. on Maui. Yeah. Yeah. So they're all over the state and they do range from public to private. We do strongly, uh, we can't make it clear enough that if you'll see it on there, it says private property, please don't go on the private property to check these trees out unless you have permission. Uh, but the public ones definitely go and check out. They're really cool experience. And our, uh, we're about to roll out a new update um, that shows the approximate age of the trees and the reasoning the criteria for selection for oahu um, we've started going through a lot of old um, nomination forms because those are the two most common questions we get is how old is the tree and why was it selected and and then so people could just go onto your your website and look at this uh the exceptional tree map and really make uh, just a day of it and um and go around and look at some of these amazing trees, these these beings that we're increasingly finding out are pretty sentient beings, although not in the way that we have thought of it in the past, and just enjoy their, their beauty and splendor, as well as maybe uh, learn about some history, how old they are and what kind they are, uh, which is very cool. Um, so you have actually furthered this work by getting a master's degree uh, 
that is related to this. So what was your thesis on and how is that going to help aid in this um, um, exceptional trees listing as it becomes more, uh, I guess, universalized? Right. So essentially the research uh, began from working on Hawaii's exceptional tree program, looking at how the counties w administered and uh, chose the nominees. So it's, as I mentioned before, it's a statewide law administered out of each county. But there was a lot, I noticed a lack of standardization amongst how these committees were choosing. And, and obviously, you know, it is a fairly subjective process. Yeah. You do have expert opinion, but it can vary if you have the same group on each island. So I started looking to see maybe there's a way to make it more standardized, less subjective. And maybe the UN or somebody had a, pro, a program for these recognized trees that we can pull some information and maybe improve our own program. And it didn't exist. And I started doing some research and saw that these programs are popping up quite regularly across the world, but there's no standard template of how to even determine what criteria should be used for these trees. So each program is just reinventing the wheel each time. And a lot of common mistakes are being seen over and over again. So the research I started focusing on for my thesis was, okay, well, what is a heritage tree or exceptional tree? And that in itself has a lot of interesting uh, aspects to it because there's over 60 terms around the world used to denote these trees of importance. So just narrowing it down to you know, exceptional heritage, today we'll use exceptional uh, as it relates to Hawaii's program, but just even selecting a name to refer to these trees is, is pretty, sub pretty subjective. So I assembled a, a group of international experts who, for heritage trees, exceptional trees, and over the course of a year and several um, rounds of really intensive research, uh, they were presented initially with a literature review showing, you know, here's a, um, a review of 46 case studies from around the world. Here's how they uh, nominate their trees using these criteria. From this and through this rigor, uh, rigor, rigorous process, which criteria, and there were 50, do you think should be the most important and useful criteria that are applicable at any geographic scale. So anywhere in the world, from a small little town to the national level. And that's what we worked with. That's, uh, so that's awesome research. I know that was a huge undertaking and I look forward to seeing your published paper, which hopefully will be coming sometime soon. And uh, all the other things that you uh, that continue going to do at the Outer Circle and the great work that you do as program director, sadly, our half hour is up. Amazing. It just goes by like that. So I hope you will come back again and be our guest and, and go into some more depth on, on some of these things and learn about other programs. But unfortunately, we got to wrap it up for now. So I will say thank you so much to Mr. Miles Ritchie, the Programs Director at the Outdoor Circle Organization, doing terrific work. Mr. Ritchie doing terrific work. And we hope to see you here every other week at Out and About on ThinkTech Hawaii. Aloha, everyone.